Hello. I'm Michael Opitz, your host, and I want to welcome you to our eighth Internet radio broadcast. Our show today includes my guest host, Christina Jeffrey, Ph.D. political science, former House historian and college professor. Uh, James Strawn is the technical producer for the show, social media consultant and editor for DecidingTheVote.com, a blog forum for politically active citizens and professionals. We are just citizens who are supported by a network of people who share information and stories that provide insight that's not offered by the big media. And this show is about sharing that information with a perspective of accurate facts and truth. Uh, Christina Jeffrey is uh, uh, is with us, and uh, Christina, just to kind of kick off the show today, it's uh, we know about the the big budget battle, and the approving of the uh, the budget uh, to avoid a total uh, government shutdown, and uh, uh, this is by Thursday, uh, October the seventeenth. And we are told that on that day, if we don't have a budget uh, approved, there will be a default on our debt. Then we hear other people telling us that that's not so. We have plenty of money coming in, plenty of revenue coming in, and we can pay the interest on our loans. And if we are able to do that, then there is no default. And we've got plenty of money to cover all the other basic needs, including the military, Social Security, and so on. But I heard something very interesting this morning on uh, it was either the TV or the radio that uh, the Treasury Department has claimed that it uh, will make the determination of whether or not uh, the nation is in default, that they have that authority. And, of course, the Treasury comes directly under Barack Obama. So if Barack Obama decides that he wants to... Uh, Called the United States as being in default, then that will be his prerogative. I've never heard of such a thing. Well, I've never heard of such a thing either. And uh, but but it's just you know the the outrage de jour. I, I wouldn't be surprised if the president wasn't chomping at the bit to declare the country in default. He wanted apparently for the stock market to to uh, take a significant a significant hit and uh, all of the the pundits were were predicting such a hit, and uh, and were surprised and disappointed when when the market didn't open lower. In fact, it was going still going up uh, at three o'clock. Now, the uh, the there are two issues before us. One is uh, 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 funding the government, uh, which is in shutdown right now, at least. Eighty-three percent of the government is up and working, so it's uh, it's only the non-essential people who are not working, and that eight hundred thousand of them. And that leads us to another question: is if they're non-essential, uh, why do we have a concern? Uh, that's a great I guess it, we, that would might be a, just an easy way to save a lot of money. Uh, maybe that's why the stock market is going up. Except they that's right. The stock market say, "Oh, we're saving money," and you know, the stock market might even go even further up if. Uh, if uh, the government were really shut down and, and couldn't collect taxes, because on the one hand, yes, we would be in default, but on the other hand, um, yeah, everybody would be kind of happy to see the IRS shut down for a while. Uh, I understand they're working with minimal staff. They're, the staff that they're working with are the, is the staff that is used to process income, but they're not utilizing any staff to send out refunds. Well, of course, maximum pain. We will take your money, but we will not refund your money. <laughs> oh, please, Incredible. the whole thing is the whole thing is ludicrous. If only we had uh, had our own Gilbert and Sullivan, you know, serious uh, observers of the common wheel, uh, with a genuine interest in in good government and an eye for for absolute clownishness. In government, uh, that would that would uh, make an excellent farce. Uh, for those of you not familiar with Gilbert and Sullivan, they did Pirates of Penzance, and uh, that has turned out to be one of my favorite musicals. And the line in there is, as the pirates are coming to uh, uh, to attack this island, and the, the pirates are this is comedic uh, sketch. So 
the pirates are not uh, really bloodthirsty pirates, but uh, they want to take over the island and do what they can while in, not incurring any uh, scraped knees. <laughs> Meanwhile, the government of the island is determined that they're going to defend the island, so they call up the police, and these are almost like the Keystone Cops, and they march around <laughs> singing and shouting. Or the Obama administration, have it your way. <laughs> uh, you know, the imagery there is uh, is, is pretty darn close. So they, they walk around uh, singing and dancing that they're going out to defend them, uh, to defend the island and defend the uh, ladies of the island, uh, but they keep marching around and singing, that, saying what they're going to do. And so the ladies finally start getting wise to this, and they say, they say they're going, but they do not go. <laughs> so, no, this, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan uh, would certainly uh, uh, write a uh, – this is this is absolutely made for them. And I've, it's uh, absolutely made for them. Where Where is our Gilbert and where is our Sullivan? If it weren't so darn serious, it would uh, it'd really be funny. But it's so serious, if the Treasury Department does uh, call it a default, then there are lots of things that automatically happen. And uh, there could be a significant disruption on our society. And, uh, do we do we do we allow do we allow other nations to declare whether or not they are in default? Has this ever question. happened? I don't know that Do banana other republics? nations have ever declared they're in default. That's, you raise a great point. But usually, they don't, you don't declare you're in default. You're other in default when you can't pay the bill. That, yeah, other people, other, other, uh, other, <laughs> no man shall be a judge in his own cause, right? Right. Right. Quoth Madison in the Federalist Papers. And so the Treasury should not be the judge of whether or not the Treasury is in default. That is ludicrous. It's the creditors who would say, you have <laughs> That's not paid right. <laughs> and do you have any money to pay me, or are you just intentionally withholding? So if you have the money in your bank account to pay, then yeah. you, and you must pay. It would so be it's criminal. It would be criminal to stop paying the creditors if you had oh. the money. Oh, my goodness. Christina, you raise a great point. It would be criminal. Is that a criminal act? Yes. It's not, yeah. So if it's a criminal act and the Treasury declares it, and if the president has told the Treasury, or if – and who is the secretary of the Treasury these days? Well, it's not Frank Paulson, but it's probably somebody else of his ilk. Uh, is it Lee? That sounds – that that guy was was a, like assistant to Paulson. Break. <laughs> James, who who is this guy? Uh, I can't remember his first name. His last name's Lou, isn't it? Uh, Lou. 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 That's right. James I, I Lou. Stretching. Jim. But I'm I'm going to Google it right this very minute. Yeah, Google it. Rob Break. We might as well get it right, huh? I'll say who is the Secretary of the Treasury, and, and I'll also get to sound smart. Yeah. In in okay. you. Secretary of the Treasury, State Department of Treasury, Treasury. Get it? Uh, bother. Sometimes Wikipedia is a nice thing to pull up, and sometimes it's too old. It's L E W, I think. L E W. I'll Google it. What's his first name? Well, we'll just call him Secretary Lou. <coughs> I don't see him, but it's Lou. Yeah, I know it. I saw it. It's Secretary Lou. I might I find his first, first name. name. Okay. Uh, uh, let's pick up then where I say, and uh, and who is the head of Treasury? Uh, go. And, Christina, who is the head of the Treasury? Uh, Secretary Lou. So would Lou be the one uh, 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 stating that we are uh, in default, or would it be the president telling Lou? That, well, uh, if it follows the usual path, um, 
Jack Lew will cover for Obama and claim that he took it on his own initiative to declare that. And so he would get impeached and go to jail. That's right. If we have money there to pay the bills and we're saying that we don't, that's uh, that's uh, uh, not just disingenuous. That's fraud. That's fraud. So, well, we've been there before. Uh, our attorney general will not ever prosecute that. So, uh, he gets <laughs> well, but impeachment is uh, impeachment of administration officers is the duty of the House. You're right. It is the problem with the House is that Boehner, under Boehner's leadership, uh, well, Boehner is Boehner is weak. Boehner uh, has had opportunity after opportunity. A matter of fact, it has been his duty to hold these people accountable when they are in violation of the Constitution and begin an impeachment inquiry, and he has refused to do so. So he has been complicit as well. If the officer, if the police officer will not do his duty when he sees a crime being reported or, uh, or occurring, in this case the House, and they refuse to do it, all they do is encourage more of the same kind of unconstitutional behavior or treason yeah, yeah. against the Constitution. They're, they're, they're enabling. But we're, but we're getting beyond political crimes, uh, not following the Constitution, not doing your job as Speaker of the House. Those are, those are political, um, that's, that's, you know, it's political behavior. But not paying creditors? who have a legal claim on the Treasury of the United States, that's fraud. It is fraud, especially when you say that you you can't do it and uh, when we have the money coming in to do it. So anyway, I don't know if this is a – you know, you hear so much in the news that is wrong uh, and incomplete. But this was on a national news station, uh, Network News, and so I at least give it a little – little credibility or am I wrong in doing so? <laughs> well, I, 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 I'm, I'm quite confident that uh, a reporter would not want this to uh, be credited to their news station if they had no source. Now, whether or not, you know, once upon a time, something like that would never be reported unless there were two corroborating sources. Um, reporters aren't, you know, with this 27-hour, 24-hour news cycle, they're sometimes not as careful. So, you know, the source could have leaked something that turned out to be wrong. And, and that happens all the time. I mean, I, I remember that happening way back when I was a, when I was a little kid. I noticed, I mean, not little, I was never little, but when I was, um, oh, say, in my teens, I noticed that the news early in the morning would be different from the news later in the afternoon. And it was usually more interesting in the morning uh, before more people started more cleaning it up. Yeah, more speculative <laughs> where, where uh, while eyes are still blurry. <laughs> maybe the, so. Yeah. Or maybe before the correction police get in there. Oh, we didn't mean to say that. No. Well, you know, one of the reasons for the growing popularity of uh, uh, podcast radio shows uh, such as we have here is that there is such great dissatisfaction uh, with the media and, uh, uh, and credibility. The media mm -hmm. no longer has the credibility that it used to have, or at least, and I say credibility, I noticed I didn't say that it was more truthful, but it uh, the people... You know, we only had three networks to choose from, but now there's an alternative, uh, alternative sources of news from the internet. But we see a growing number of uh, local news, uh, grassroots news media such as ourselves, so we can get information out there, and people can tune into us at their convenience. And 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 we are growing in popular popularity, are we not? Oh, we are. I received a. Uh, a contact uh, earlier, uh, uh, well, last week, uh, from a group in New Hampshire would like for me to appear on their uh, radio podcast show. And I've gotten an invitation from uh, Dean Kelly, who has started a, a television show there in northeast Georgia, northwest Georgia. And I'll be on his show on uh, on the 21st of this month. And he is... Uh, 
he's out selling advertising to sponsor it, and uh, he's doing it on his own, and he's found a, uh, a broadcast uh, station, an uh, Internet broadcast station that will uh, give him the time if he uh, is able to fund it. Uh, wow, that's very encouraging. Well, what about what about our show? Uh, our show is great. I know, <laughs> I know tough, it's great, but, but are we getting I, are we getting more more followers? Uh, yes, we are. We we are growing. Uh, a matter of fact, I received a uh, an email today that uh, uh, from someone in quite frankly in the mainstream media here in Atlanta who has recommended a guest to us. Nice. Uh, I haven't shared that with you yet, but it's nice that we are getting the recognition that, uh, that and we make every effort at being accurate and uh, uh, truthful so that we establish that kind of reputation. We're just not going to throw things around that aren't true and uh, that are not fact. Uh, so we do have the reputation, and a lot of that comes from uh, our association with the Madison Forum. I'm, this is not a Madison Forum radio program, but you're a Madison Forum member. I'm a Madison Forum member, and James Strawn, our technical producer and uh, uh, publisher of the website, DecidingTheVote.com, is also a Madison Forum member. So that Well, we know our important. Madison Forum members are listening and it's a pretty sharp group, and if we make mistakes, we're going to hear from our friends in the Madison Forum, so we need to be accurate. We do, and that website address is www.themadisonforum.com. So that's a good place for historical information, current information, and then we're working with decidingthevote.com, and between those two websites, there's just an awful lot of current information and historical information that that helps guide us along the right paths. Well, you know, talking about truth, we all, you know, we all believe in truth, and uh, we all know though that that the temptation to lie and make yourself look better is great for everybody, and probably greater for for people in politics. But somebody somebody explained lying to me in a way that just just gave me sort of a, a mental image of of what it what you do when you lie, and in small things it 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 you know it makes a small impact, but in big things it makes a big impact. And what you do is you almost bend the universe, and 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 and. Uh, and you create falsehood in people's worlds. Not, you know, it's not just a simple lie. It can make somebody view something that's very important and very important that they know, you know, the truth. And yet, their mind has been warped, really, and the universe for them is warped by this distortion of reality. Uh, that's, uh, <clears throat> you're really waxing metaphysical there, but I, I see the truth and validity in your statement. Let me, let me put it to you from another direction. That, uh, the, uh, the root of all evil is the lie. And if you have a lie, uh, if you have inaccurate information, incorrect information, and people know it's inaccurate and, uh, incorrect, and that translates as a lie, and anything that you build on uh, using that as a foundation, uh, you, whether it's an actual building or a philosophical uh, direction, then that whole foundation is uh, will collapse. It's on shaky ground. And you can't have anybody around you who is a uh, constant liar. You can't have a business partner who is a liar because that will damage the business, damage the relationship, and it will go bankrupt. You can't have a spouse who lies to you. You can't have a friend who constantly lies to you. And here we have found that we have a government that is lying to us every single day about what is happening and what they're doing and why they're doing it. So with that kind of foundation, we're in real trouble. Yeah, truly, truly we are, truly we are. The New York Times had an article about lying, but... Not surprisingly, they've taken it down. 
Do you recall what they said? <laughs> it was it was called Great Betrayals. Um and I don't think I don't think I can get to it anymore. Well, you know, there there are so there are so many uh, uh, lies uh, uh, coming from government, and one that comes to mind is the 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 lie that led us into the uh, Vietnamese War. It was the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which was based on this <clears throat> information that North Vietnamese gunboats attacked our battleships. Now, I'm thinking of this tiny little gunboat attacking our battleship. Now that you think about it. <laughs> yeah, you know, a mosquito attacking our battleship, excuse me. And so Congress said, aha, we can't have this. And so we're going to declare, not declare war, but kind of declare war and send 500,000 troops into Vietnam to uh, to battle the North Vietnamese. So it, it was later disclosed that the Gulf of Tonkin on which that resolution was based, that incident, never occurred. It was fabrication in order to gin up support uh, for Lyndon Johnson to send in 500,000 troops to north uh, to South Vietnam to supposedly defend against the North. Yeah, and and the rest is 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 really our history as baby boomers. And then we find out too is the anniversary of uh, JFK's death is uh, is uh, coming up. Is that JFK had already signed the paperwork to withdraw our advisors from South Vietnam. So the whole all of history would have changed for America mm-hmm. without the Vietnam War, but it was based on a lie, and we had fifty thousand casualties based on a lie, and that changed our country forever, along with uh, JFK's assassination, and we've never been able to get to the real truth. But we do know that the uh, the, uh, commission, the Warren Commission, was directed to come up with a single-shooter concept that, uh, through recent disclosures, has now been proven. And uh, uh, so there's still so much mystery there that the government records that were supposed to have been available to us have been sealed for an additional 25 years. Now, what kind of national secrets are they covering up? Obviously, there's no major national secret <clears throat> that could be covered up at this point. Only the truth is being restrained. So, uh, well, I'll tell you what I thought about when I read that 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 New York Times article. It's called. Great Betrayals, and it was by a psychiatrist named Anna Fells, I think. And she was talking about patients who have been lied to by a spouse or a business partner in somebody in a very intimate relationship where they thought the world was one thing and found out it was another. And that you almost lose your identity in that situation. And the liars go on and live often happy lives afterwards. They're very sorry. They, you know, sometimes they make amends of some sort. But they, but it doesn't have the impact on them because they always knew the truth. It's the person who was lied to that is whose life is changed. And we, as a generation, we were lied to. Oh, we were. We were. Now, you know, some you you mentioned that the liar knows the truth. Uh, generally that's so, but when you have a psychopathic liar, uh, oftentimes uh, the liar uh, does not know the truth and when he lies. Well, and that would be in a personal situation, but in an entire generation, <laughs> the people oh, yeah. who lied to us knew they were lying. Yeah, we don't have a Congress full of psychopaths. So no, no, there are people who know, and I'm sure the whole Congress did not know. No, I'm I'm sure they didn't, but there were a lot of people who did know, uh, um, a whole lot of people who knew. Did you ever hear of Shelley Davis? No. Shelley Davis was appointed to be historian of the of the IRS about the same time I was appointed to be historian of the House of Representatives. And she came across 
some IRS records that indicated that JFK, just like some other people we know, had used the IRS to punish his uh, his political enemies. Dare you say such a thing, Chris? Well, dare she say such a thing? And <laughs> she was told to destroy those. Really? Well, historians historians can't do that. They simply yeah. can't do that. So yeah. she was fired. And she wrote a book about her experiences. I I would like to say that that's incredible, but that's certainly not incredible. Well, it was all in the Wall Street Journal, which um when was that published? Probably about 96, 7, something like that. Oh. Well, Shelley you're Davis. An ac- you're an accurate historian, Christina. Well, well, we have th- that that remains to be verified. <laughs> Trust, but verify. That's right. History as we know can be changed. <laughs> Well, and and my my memory of dates could be wrong. Well, you're probably close enough that we're really dealing with the facts on that. Yeah, I I I, I, I followed her story very closely because I found it exceedingly interesting. What would happen if the uh, Treasury declared that we are in default, Christina? And yeah, actually... what if the Treasury declares we're in default and people shrug their shoulders like Churchill did and said, you know, saying something is so is, does not make it so? Then we get back to reality. Yeah, what if we just – because the Treasury is much more likely to declare us in default than to really actually stop paying interest on its obligations. Got to let that sink in a little bit. Uh, What are the ramifications either way? If they say they were in default and they continue to pay the obligations, then I mean, but that would be so typical of this administration. You know, they say the government is shut down, but only eighty-three, only seventeen percent of the government is shut down. But yet they still uh, use that language. The non-essential part of government. Yeah, so they'll pay, the Treasury will pay the non-essential bills. Those would be the ones that would cause the most pain and hurt and harm to people. Such as closing off the uh, the, the National Mall. For so 90-year-olds. Can, yeah, so people in the Veterans Memorial, so these are open-air memorials, to prevent them from walking on the cement because we don't have any guards to pick up the trash. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and those, are so t- those guys are so messy in their wheelchairs. Or uh, denying death benefits, the $15,000 that is immediately paid to a family when they lose a loved one so that they can take care of immediate expenses. This is this is going cruel. so far beyond the pale. It's hard to even conceive. But it's even harder to to fathom. Here we have millions of Egyptians taking to the square, protesting against... Morsi, who is head of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, and protesting against him and the uh, the rigged elections in Egypt. Uh, but the citizens in Egypt, we typically don't think of as being sophisticated and as knowledgeable as the citizens in America, but they've done what American citizens have not done. They expressed a very strong uh, objection to what their government was doing, and they changed their government. And we can't seem to muster the number of folks in Washington and around the nation to field a strong protest of millions of people. How many millions turned out in Egypt? Uh, three million, or was it? It looked. More? It seemed that 30, the whole country was in the streets. <laughs> Thirty million. <laughs> Maybe I, I, it might I have been that something like that. Was, I'm, I've never seen numbers like that. No. And how is it that Egypt is uh, is motivated to have a better... Now, we hear that uh, Morsi was democratically elected, but once they found out who he was and what his policies were that were hurting the nation, they demanded that he be removed, and he was. So how do, how do we relate to that to... Uh, uh, those who currently run the government. Once we find out who they are, then do we just sit by quietly and wait for the next election, or do we protest? Uh, a, a nonviolent protest, of course, a civil protest. 
Well, I guess it's because Americans are pretty comfortable and Egypt is broke. So maybe, their maybe situation that's may be more dire. Maybe that's it, because the Egyptians, uh, they rely on the tourist trade, and there is no tourism in Egypt, So they're, and, the, and they didn't have any money. Uh, they didn't have any food. Things were getting really desperate there. Yeah. And, and you know, Obama's still shoveling out lots of money. Not to Egypt. Not to Egypt, but to Americans. Yeah, he is. You know, the, the Chinese, the way the, uh, the Chinese uh, subdued Tibet, was that they gave the Tibetans washing machines and dryers and made their life more comfortable. And uh, that eased the protest against the, uh, uh, their chi- the Chinese masters who came in to rule Tibet, uh, satisfy the people, give them what they need uh, to make them complacent, and uh, we will take over. Uh, uh, it seems that uh, that has happened in America, but now people are falling upon harder times but there's still not enough pain to make them take to the streets like the uh, the citizens of Egypt. Well, America, America was actually compared to a, a relatively a wealthy country uh, when approximately a third of the Americans decided that they were fed up enough to, to fight the British, and they had the energy, even though they were only a third, to to muster electoral majorities and uh, and start a new country. Actually, what percentage of the uh, of the American people, the, the revolutionaries, the the uh, Thomas Paines, the John Adams, and the uh, and the other uh, many bitty folks whose names lost into the ages? But was it ten percent or fifteen percent who strongly opposed King George and uh, pushed hard? With their lives. Oh, it was probably. I mean, the really the people who were really upset and were in, you know involved was probably some tiny percent, like ten percent. But the figure I've always heard of Americans and the general population supporting the revolution was about a third. The Tories were about a third. People who could go either way was about a third. It's kind of like almost everything. Yep. Yeah. You, you uh, had, so. People haven't people haven't changed. There were a lot of folks who, uh, yeah, the 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 hardcore uh, radicals are, who are our founding fathers and gave us such a wonderful country, and there are people who are calling them radicals today. But they like, they weren't really. They they, uh, they they were they just wanted those nice conservative values that the British uh, exemplified. Uh, you know, rights to trial by jury rights to representation, uh, local self-government. These are all very conservative, very conservative um, uh, values that they, that they wanted. Certainly nothing like the French Revolution. The French Revolution was radical, and, um, and the people who were involved in it were like, you know, they were, <laughs> they were marching in lockstep. They were, they were, you know, they were organized and, and subserving it to their leaders, the Americans, you know, retained their individuality throughout the whole process. And uh, the French Revolution was uh, indeed a uh, very bloody revolution. The guillotine was made popular during that uh, that time. But I want to go back to another uh, 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 issue that I heard you state: the uh, the conservatives. And we hear conservatives, moderates, and liberals. And quite frankly, I'm not sure what a conservative is anymore, and I certainly don't know what a moderate is. So I'd like for you to help me understand, maybe help the audience understand too, what is a moderate? Well, I like to consider myself... I like to consider myself uh, an Aristotelian moderate. Um, there's a, you know, there are always extreme positions, and they're usually not, uh, they're they're usually not um, the the wisest place to be. But um, you know, moderation in all things to me is a, a virtue, even though 
um, I, you know, I was stirred as a teenager by what is it? Uh, I mean, there's some things you shouldn't be moderate about. Virtues are not things you should be moderate about. You should you should embrace you know embrace telling the truth. And uh, but does that mean that you would you would betray the Jews during the the Nazi Holocaust uh, by telling the soldiers where they are? No, you would you would use a mental reservation <laughs> and and not betray the Jews. But but a you know but in general. You know, virtue should be clung to with uh, a lot of uh, a lot of seriousness and devotion, and vices should be avoided with a lot of seriousness and, devo- and devotion. But a moderate would say, uh, "I'm going to avoid excessive drink, excessive excessive uh, eating, and I'm going to take the the middle way between excess and and hardship." And in politics. Uh, you cannot have a democratic system and refuse to to negotiate and refuse to to um, compromise with your opponents, even though you are absolutely certain that you are right and they are wrong. The democratic process requires give and take, and the truth is, it is Barack Obama who's refusing right now. So a conservative realizes. In order to conserve the system that you have, you are going to have to you are going to have to work with people that you don't agree with. Uh, I heard you. I heard you. But I think uh, conservatism is 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 a, is a essentially moderate um, approach to life, politics, society, uh, I, I culture. I don't know that. You know, I'll I'll throw out a little witticism here uh, on uh, the definition of moderate. Moderate is what one liberal calls another one. <laughs> well, yes, in 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 television media, in the media, that's exactly right. Yeah. We have so, in, in in our local, we have a we have a conservative newspaper that's published in Greenville, South Carolina, and it's called the Times Examiner. And every week, there is something uh, written by Walter McSherry brilliant uh, gentleman it's called the liberal dictionary and i think that's the definition of moderate in the liberal dictionary now, when we we refer today uh, uh as moderate politicians to me that if uh, is someone who doesn't have a strong set of principles to guide them for instance if you're a believer in the Constitution and adherence in the Constitution, and the Constitution is not a living document, just like any legal contract is not. And uh, which uh, which of our founders said, uh, was it Jefferson who said, if you are, or Madison who said, if you want to discern what was meant in the Constitution, you must carry yourself back to the time when it was written and discern what it was addressing at that time, not for us to try to decide now, but we must look at how what were the original uh, what was the original discussion, and then you will know what the intent of the Constitution is. So well, certainly, time- Madison Madison kept the minutes of the of the Constitutional Convention, and that's a great source. And the problems that they were facing weren't confined to the time that they lived in. They're, they face they face any government that's trying to preserve liberty and yet also have order. We discussed at the Madison Forum luncheon today. There's a list of uh, of steps uh, in any uh, of the Republicans re, uh, republics that have gone before us. Uh, and one of the final steps is complacency, where the citizens become complacent. And the next step after complacency is tyranny. Sure. Because because that government falls and a tyrannical government arises. Sure. But but let's go back to moderate again. Uh, moderate to me is someone. 
Now, we talk about uh, in negotiations, uh, in, uh, you can negotiate how to get to where you need to go, but you don't ever negotiate your principles. So if you negotiate things that are outside the Constitution, that's negotiating a principle or uh, abandoning. Exactly, exactly. Principle. And But if you take that position, the uh, the left will call you an extremist. Well, that's right, and that's right. what I'm but, getting at. But calling you an extremist doesn't make you an extremist. That's right. But we You're a principled that, constitutionalist. We see that there are a lot of uh, the folks, when they refer to folks as, oh, he's an extreme right winger. When I look at that and who they're talking about, they're – oftentimes talking about a strong constitutionalist. And the Constitution mm -hmm. is the foundation. It's the bedrock of uh, of America. It is what brought us to where we... I, won't, I don't really want to say where we are today, because where we are today is not as good as where we were. It brought us years. to where we ought to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, it allowed, for, it allowed for a strong economy. It allowed people to to risk and, and uh, to to succeed. It it allowed us to grow and accommodate uh, what 200 percent since the founding, uh, 200 2,000 percent. So, is a uh, sound fiscal policy is that uh, uh, is uh, that a con uh, we generally would describe that as being a conservative principle? That's conservative, and it's and it's moderate. How is that moderate? Well, because only somebody who was uh, too cheap to to spend or too um, reckless to save would uh, would oppose a sound fiscal policy. But a moderate might <clears throat> generally, as one said, well, we need to have that, but in this case, let's look at it this way and let's make an exception here. So that we can be practical. To me, that's ah, now that's see, that's somebody, that's somebody uh, telling you that in order to in order to be a moderate, which which is a which is a good word. There's nothing wrong with that word. It's been stolen from us, but but it's but it's a it's a um, it's Aristotelian to to moderate. Um, so in order to be a moderate, in order for us to call you a moderate, Michael, you are going to have to bend your principles. Yes, help me help me understand which principles I need to bend. Yes, yeah. Well, so it depends on which principles. My principles which, are. <laughs> it depends are on which principles are in our way. <laughs> <laughs> if we want to tell a lie, then your principle of telling the truth is in the way. If we want to rob the rich and give to the poor, then your your principle of justice is in the way. It all depends. Everything is relative. Everything is relative. It's moral relativism. Um, I, I just you know, talking about the New York Times article on the Great Betrayal reminded me of a conversation that I had with Toby Horshaw, who was then Who's the Toby editorial Horshaw? page editor of the New York Times. And I was complaining about a line of articles they had written that were uh, were wrong. And I was trying to persuade Toby that uh, as the newspaper of record, it should be concerned with truth and justice and toby said to me what is truth what is justice and you replied back <laughs> may i please speak to your editor <laughs> <laughs> and he said yes yes you may mrs jeffrey but i'm going to tell him that you are a troublesome woman and indeed i have found that to be so over the years and the thing that makes you a troublesome woman is that uh, you don't let things that need to go noticed go unnoticed. I like to I like to think that that is a conservative and moderate position. Oh, I think that is an extremist position. <laughs> that is a very very non-negotiable position. When you see a wrong that is being done, you can't say, "Well, it's okay here." You know, let me moderate that. <laughs> it's it's an absolute. When, it so depends are, on if you're using the liberal dictionary or not. Oh, because okay. in America, where where we are the the you know the home of the free and the land of the brave, and where uh, the American the American way is uh, involves truth and justice, then 
following the the American way, the moderate path would be to uphold those things. And when they're when they're being when they're not uh, being upheld, to point it out and rally people to uh, to bring things back into line. And when you bring things back into line, well, you're not off to the left, you're not off to the right, you're just right in line, right in line with the Constitution and truth and justice. I, I think that's a nice well, middle of the road I, path. I see what you're saying is, and I think we're both saying the same thing. Only I'm ascribing that to the uh, to the, and I don't want to use the word far right. I want to describe that to the uh, to the position that is not negotiable. Uh, well, it's not negotiable because, like you said, you're talking about principles, your basic first principles. And your first principles are not negotiable. But ah, uh, according according to the liberals, then you would not be a moderate, Christina. You would be a right wing radical. That's right. So I but guess we the, get, uh, I, I I I I have I consult Socrates and and other wise men, Aristotle, and uh, Thomas Aquinas and Augustine, and, and I find that I'm a moderate. And these guys have got their liberal dictionary, but but I don't use their dictionary. So uh, they're they're so, they're really inferior. So those terms, uh, as interpreted by the press and the populace, when we hear the term moderate, we see that term being most uh, applied most often to those people who really have no principles, and we see them in politics. They can be mm-hmm. on one side of an issue today. Mm-hmm. And they'll be and, on the other side of the issue tomorrow, and they're willing to compromise any mm-hmm. they're willing to compromise principles. You read 1984. Yeah, George Orwell. That's new speak. So you change the meanings of words. And we see that quite often. We do, but we moderates uh, we we're, we're fighting back with with uh, with the with the traditional definitions. And and uh, you know we're hoping that that we retain some understanding of what these these words mean, so that we can communicate with each other. Well, mm-hmm. it hurts me to think that I consider myself a moderate, but I guess. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but I guess with your definition, that I'm a moderate. You I'm are, Michael. You are a wonderful moderate. You're not an extremist. You're not you know careening from one side to the other depending on what is the convenient position to have. Well, I uh I Yeah, I'm look at look at Mr. Obama. I mean, he how many times did he say in the Senate that a shutdown was unacceptable, that uh that uh, raising the debt limit was unacceptable? Well, then was then and now is now. That's right. So when when was he being principled and when was he being unprincipled? He's never principled. And I guess that's the would, sad truth. You would be before many people thought he was principled with his first statement, but when he changes it, we say, well, he wasn't principled then, and is he principled then now? The answer is no, because you can't be on both sides of that same issue and simply change your mind. Well, principled people agonize. Sometimes they do change their mind, but they agonize over it and they explain themselves. They explain why why they have changed their mind, why they've seen the light, why they know they were wrong. But, well, re- but liars don't do that. Well, I remember a statement uh, when Bill Clinton originally ran for the presidency. He uh, was very strong on balancing the budget. That was oh, yeah. He was a conservative Democrat. What was the name of his group? The New Democrats? The New Democrats. And we don't hear that term anymore. That's No, no, that's lost in the... Yeah. But he said, <clears throat> after he he was strong on balancing the budget, we have to balance the budget. And uh, I, I felt that I knew he was a charlatan. And so I mentioned to one of my liberal friends, I said... Uh, uh, Bill Bill Clinton is is lying to folks about his wanting to balance the budget. He has no intent to balance the budget. And my liberal Democrat friend said, "Of course he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's just political campaign speech. Why would you even consider that as uh, as a truthful position? Uh, we know we know uh-huh. that he doesn't mean it." 
And you think he does mean it? Or you on the <laughs> other side thinks he means that? What's Mary Madeline's husband's name? James George Carville. Car- James Carville. You know what James Car- Carville called that? What? He called that boob bait for the bubbas. <laughs> so there is a term for it. Somehow there's when a term there's a term, term when there's a term for things it makes it seem more practical. Well, but, that's what it was. And, and that, another thing that he he campaigned I, I I was astounded when I realized my students thought that the Democrat Party was the party of family values. No. And then I learned in 92 that that the Democrats were running ads, pro-life ads uh for Clinton on the uh on the Christian radio stations. Boob bait for the bubbas. Carville said that and I didn't even know it. But to finish it, let me finish that thought on Bill. And uh yes, he was elected as we all know. And then the issue uh he addressed that I think some ten or twelve times on balancing the budget. And then he finally said even bef- even before the tenth time he said after working for three or four days or weeks on this, he, he was always talking about how hard he Remember that he said, "I worked harder than I have ever worked." I remember that to balance the budget, and it just can't be done. <laughs> well, at least he gave some explanation, which is that more than harder. Obama has given us for his change of positions. That he worked harder and discovered he couldn't be done, and yet Newt came along. And uh, behind him, and, and did House it, re- and did it, and then Clinton lays claim credit for it. <laughs> because thank thank goodness Bill Clinton from his his side, he had Dick Morris who uh, showed him the proper way through triangulation to backtrack on all of his words and come around through the revolving door and pop out a new man. <laughs> Dick Morris is quite an amazing guy. Yep, 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 yep. Now he's a conservative guru. Indeed, of he is. I, I I wish that he had gotten his uh, predictions. Ac- uh, I wish he had predicted accurately in this last election. Christina, do you have any uh, uh, words of wisdom or other comments to make before we, uh, as we're nearing our final minutes of the show? Well, I do have some words of wisdom. If sure. you have gold jewelry, don't leave it for two hours in uh, in the wrong kind of silver cleaner. <laughs> Did it turn green, Christina? <laughs> it, it turned something. I don't know, but it doesn't look very good. <laughs> Just notice what it was that I had put it in. Oh my gosh! Uh, radio can be very distracting, but I hope that it has been a uh, a good distraction for most people, and that they weren't as distracted as I was and did something quite that unbelievably <laughs> stupid. <laughs> Well, we we are human, and we do do those things. It's just those things that are... It's always so much fun to talk with you, Michael. And oh. uh, I, I look forward to the next time. And And with you as well. And we'll be back next week, and we hope that you have found the show to be both informative and is- interesting. Please tell your friends about the show and where to find us, because if we are to turn our country around, it'll take all of us working together. Many thanks to James Strawn, the technical producer for this show, which is carried on DecidingTheVote.com. My email address is mopitz, O-P-I-T-Z, at MindSpring.com. Remember, knowledge is power, ignorance is slavery. This is Michael Opitz wishing you a blessed day.